Mike Smith, thanks so much for your time. We might begin today by having you tell us a little bit about your background. Sure, well, um, a long career in the Army, uh, 34 years, and then when I retired, I decided I wanted to do something in this civil military space and something that was also connected with United Nations peacekeeping, um, which really reflected the lessons I had learned from a long time in the Army, and uh, it was time to pay back. Um, so overseas postings in places like uh, Papua New Guinea and Kashmir as a military observer. Then in Cambodia as the defence attaché straight after the elections, the United Nations mission. Um, and then finally as deputy force commander in East Timor with the United Nations mission. It just made me realise how societies, communities recovering particularly from conflict how much assistance they required and um, how much harder we had to work to try and uh, uh, assist in, in what we could do for them. So that was how I got involved in it and I was in Taiwan of all places on uh, having a discussion on security dialogue and uh, next thing I knew I was um, offered a position heading what is now Action Aid Australia, an NGO, which then was called Ostcare. So I headed that for about six years. This centre was finally established. I had been advocating for it for a while and I was asked to, uh, to head, it, head it up, to kick it off. So that's um, what I've been doing. What made you advocate for the centre? Oh, I think being out in the field and seeing the results of conflict, seeing the, the tragedies of conflict and seeing that um, it is mainly innocent civilians who are the ones most affected these days. I mean, to be in Cambodia and see people affected by landmines, you know, uh, laid by uh, militaries of different kinds over many years, and uh, just to see that, um, those sorts of things. In East Timor, to see the absolute um, destruction that occurred in Timor, to um, to see the poverty and, and to see a nation trying to establish itself out of the ashes. These were the sorts of things that made me want to stay in this space, so to speak. Um, and then I saw that from a military perspective, of course, uh, when I was serving in the military, but then when I took over the NGO, we had programs all around the world in some of those same places, Timor and Cambodia, but also in places like Palestine and in, in um, refugee camps, in places like Kenya. And of course, um, I visited those and I started seeing things from a, a different angle, from a different viewpoint. And it, all of this just cemented my view that what we actually needed was much closer civil military interaction um, between the various actors that, that can do something for these people and do something which is also in our own national interests, which is, which is really what it's all about, because the, the more peace and security we have around the world, the, uh, you know, the less we'll be involved in, in conflicts overseas. So um, that was a passion that was driving me and to see results on the ground, to see that you can make a difference, but it requires a lot of hard work. We talked earlier to Sheila Stewart, one of the keynote speakers here, and she explained that often military tends to put national security before the importance of human security. What's your view on that? Yes, well, I've actually written on human security and um, I'm a great proponent of human security. I think since the end of the Cold War, the days of just looking at national security in terms of um, deterrence and force on force and clear victories and that uh, conflicts, you know, are fought on, uh, you know, um, against rules that everybody uh, plays to, those days are gone. And the conflicts that we're now involved in are very much intrastate conflicts, more so than state conflicts. We have to, have to remain quite you know, um, uh, able to, to still, you know, be able to deter and defeat interstate conflict. But the vast majority of conflicts now are intrastate conflicts. And it's in that environment that we find ourselves and that it's there where the civil and military actors are cheek by jowl. Whether they want to be or not, that's where they are. And they have to understand each other. 
They don't always have to work with each other, but they have to understand why they sometimes can't work with each other, but more importantly, where they can and how they can do things better. It was obviously a very big step for you to go out and say, we need this. Was there an acceptance of that and an understanding? Well, I think when I first started advocating for it about uh, 10 or 12 years ago now, there really wasn't much buy-in to it uh, in, the, in Australia. But then in about 2007, uh, there was a, uh, a joint parliamentary committee inquiry into Australia's role in peacekeeping. And this provided uh, a really good opportunity for people in Australia to talk about the need for a centre of this nature. And the, the parliamentary inquiry received many submissions saying we need something to try and bring these disparate elements together a little bit better. And of course, um, uh, the government then picked that up and, and, and ran with that and said, well, this is right. And it's something that's also have starting to happen overseas in, in other centres overseas. So there's been a real need and uh, you only have to look now both in conflict and disaster management to see the military, uh, the police and the various civilian entities all working together. Whether they, you know, whether they would have wanted to or not, they are, they have to. And uh, so a centre of, like ours, the Asia Pacific Civil Military Centre of Excellence, actually provides a place where these various issues can be considered. And, um, and it's a great privilege, I think, to be able to contribute to that. Did you experience some of this yourself when you went from the military to an NGO? Yes, I did. Um, um, I think I experienced it in two ways. Um, the first experience was with my NGO colleagues who, you know, as soon as they find you're from the military, uh, you know, this culture, how could, can we accept this person sort of thing. Um, from my own experience, I didn't have that problem because I think I'd been so much in the field and I had spoken to lots of NGOs and uh, uh, international organisations. I was very familiar with the United Nations and organisations like the International Committee of the Red Cross and, you know, had had great admiration for what they were all trying to do uh, and what they were doing. So I didn't have that same reservation. I knew what I wanted to do. The great thing I learned was the way that NGOs go about preparing to do their business in the field and uh, being able to see the two different ways, the military being pretty much top down, what we, the military would call directive control, clear statement of the mission, make sure all the commanders understand and then they get on and do it. Whereas the NGO community and those working in the humanitarian and development space start from very much a bottom-up approach. What does the community want? What are your needs? How is it that we might be able to help you? Um, and so it's trying to get those two approaches coming together. Remembering all the time that the reason that you're there, of course, if you're a military, you're there because your government has sent you. But your government wants you to be there to hopefully have a sustainable peace at the end of the day. And so that's why these two ways of doing business are both required, both important, but they both have to understand each other. Yeah, you've got organisations that are just poles apart. How do you get them to have common aims and, and common beliefs? Oh, that does happen to some extent. But you know, in the field, um, I've found that um, there's a common denominator between military people and NGOs. And that common, de common denominator is service, when you think about it. You know, if you're a soldier, you're there to serve your country. You're there for a greater good, or you believe you're there for a greater good, and you give your life to that particular service. And the NGOs are similar in, in that regard. So I think there is a strong commitment um, always to leave something better than what you have found it. Now, the difference is that the military has a clear mission. It's there to do a military operation. And uh, whilst militaries may not want to have to kill people and impose authority, they may have to do that. And that's what they have to be trained to do. They've got a real role. 
that's why the taxpayer pays, pays them their wages. Uh, whereas the NGO and the humanitarian community and the development community is not interested in that at all. It's interested in the foundations of development and, and, and uh, capacity building and um, local ownership and all of those sorts of things. But whilst they've got very different roles to play, they can be mutually supportive and I've seen that on the ground. Can you give examples of this collaboration? Well, sure, I can give many examples, but um, I always remember in uh, Timor-Leste, uh, where I travelled relentlessly through the country, one of the district administrators said, summed it up to me beautifully one day when he said, we need the peacekeeping force here. And I said, why do you need the peacekeeping force? And he said, you protect the sandbox in which I can then operate. And I think that says a lot. Uh, that if the military can provide security and enable these um, nation building activities to get underway and community based uh, projects to get underway, then that does lay the foundations for you know, a sustainable peace. And that's not an easy thing and it can't come overnight. It's a, it's a long commitment once, once you embark on it. And on top of having the organisations work together, I suppose there's also the challenges of dealing with the host country. Well, the host country is key. And this is one of the big differences, I would say, about, um, you know, um, Cold War conflict and traditional peacekeeping and all of those things where you had sovereign states, sovereign states fighting each other and then uh, the United Nations or a military force would go in to keep the peace that had been decided by the two protagonists. A peace, a peace agreement had been reached. Now what we find in intrastate conflict, it's far more grey. There may be a peace agreement, there may be a settlement, but when you look at the actors in country, not everybody is playing by those rules. And so we get these very, very grey areas where you still have conflict going on and um, at the same time we've got sort of development trying to start and bringing people out of poverty. All these things are happening in the same space, whether we like it or not. Um, so the world's got a lot more complex and there's often spoilers. There's, um, in peacekeeping parlance you will find uh, some people who really want a United Nations presence just to give them time to re-gear re re, and, and, and uh, then contest for power again. So it's a very, very complicated um, uh, situation. As we've found very close to home, I mean, people now always look at Afghanistan and Iraq, but I think they're more the abnormal situations rather than the normal. Let's look closer to home. Let's look at the situation in Timor-Leste, you know, which um, is still struggling to, to establish, you know, a, a sustainable peace. And look at uh, the Solomon Islands, you know, which is um, also experiencing difficulties. So we have problems close to home and Africa has many of these problems, which is why I'm very pleased Australia is re-engaging with Africa, because we have a lot to learn from our engagement in Africa, which is pretty much the epicentre of peace and conflict studies, so we can't take ourselves out of Africa. For such a young organisation, you've assembled a very impressive collection of speakers here for this meeting. How have you managed to gain such traction so quickly? Oh, it's obviously my good looks. <laughs> That was what I thought, but I didn't like to say it. <laughs> no, I think it's, um, I'm a great believer that if you can put a good program together, you will attract people. And uh, I'm blessed with a great staff, um, and they have lots of experience. And within the centre, we have a very collegiate approach. We come together from different departments, and we have an NGO advisor. And so lots of discussions to put this program together and we've approached people and uh, I think you'd find every speaker here would say, yeah, I'd like to come and talk about this, but I really want to come and talk about this because I know who else is coming. And it's the networking that goes on and the mutual learning that goes on. Nobody's got a mortgage on uh, knowledge in this space. 
And I think the, the centre, I often say, uh, why is it that we've done so much in our first two years? It's really performance punishment. We've gone into a space and we're starting to provide something that everybody wants. And, uh, you know, my small team is saying, hey, boss, we can't do any more. We can't do any more. <laughs> so it's rather nice to know that we are servicing a need, I think, and in a way that's very collaborative in our approach. Mike, what has been your proudest achievement so far? Oh, that's, that's a hard one. Um, I, I would say if there was one thing that I thought the centre had really contributed to in, in its first two years, it would be this very critical issue of protection of civilians. Uh, it was a bit of a gamble to, for us to go into that space, but protection of civilians, both in a conflict sense, but also in when disasters are on, um, uh, is a real and pressing issue, uh, particularly in these sort of, you know, these grey areas I was talking about. And um, the United Nations has been mandating missions now since 1999 to do protection of civilians without the necessary guidelines and, uh, and doctrine to be able to do it properly. It's one thing to say, go and do it. It's another thing to say, how do you do it? And so the centre moved into that space very early in the piece and was able to establish, I think, a, um, a very credible international reputation very clearly, uh, not by saying we had the answers, but by saying we'd like to contribute to finding the answers. And so uh, in the work we've done, both with the United Nations and with the African Union, um, I think we've all learnt a great deal. So the centre's provided a little bit of a, a conduit, I suppose, and we're still doing that. And uh, it's very, very pleasing to see it go from basically um, a set of people sitting around a table uh, from, you know, Africa and the United Nations and civil society organisations only a year ago um, in a little motel in Queanbeyan, um, to say, well, let's develop some guidelines for protection of civilians to then take those to the African Union in Addis Ababa and let the African Union uh, play with those. And then they went to the African Union summit in July and uh, the, the outcome was we want more of this. Uh, so it's been quite, that would be, I think, in our short time, one of our most pleasing uh, accomplishments. But I think on the disaster management side, in our own region, in the, the Pacific and Southeast Asia, the centre has made a, a strong contribution to the development of guidelines, civil military guidelines for military assistance in disaster relief operations. And we all know since the tsunami, um, uh, that terrible tragedy that happened there, that these mega disasters in the Asia Pacific region are going to occur more and they are going to take a lot of lives. And so uh, the centre, I think, is playing an important role um, in helping to bridge that civil military gap that currently exists in disaster management. So it's a great, great achievement for our little centre, I think, in two years. What would your advice be to personnel who are about to be deployed? In a word, I'd say uh, understanding. Understanding the nature of the situation you're going into, understanding the people with whom you're going in to support or protect, understanding the role of all the actors that are going to be on the ground. Now for the military, this is a really big ask because for the military, we're saying to our soldiers, hey, we've taught you how to go and you know, fire your weapons and, and look at, after each other in adversity and to close with and kill the enemy. Now, on top of all of that, we want you to be able to go and do these sorts of functions, to be supportive, uh, sometimes not to take the lead at all, to show restraint, um, to protect civilians, to understand culture, to be able to learn the language, these are big issues, you know. And of course, every soldier can't do everything. It's impossible. So we need to be able to make all of our uh, soldiers, sailors and airmen, understand the need for this and that to provide within the force structure that they have 
the requisite resources that they can draw on to do that, to be able to communicate um, with the other actors and particularly with the local community. We need to, for the police, we need to be able to make sure that any police we're sending are similarly sensitised to those situations. And we need to make sure that they understand that the type of community policing they might be doing or the capacity building of, of local police forces that they might be undertaking is not the same as in Australia necessarily, so they have to adapt as well. And for our civilian colleagues, both government and in um, you know, those going to, to fill civilian um, billets in the host government um, or the United Nations, we need to make sure they have a good understanding of civil military relations because whether they like it or not, guess what? They're going to come up against military forces and they have to understand how to work with them. So it's all about understanding knowledge management, sharing information, um, and realising that you're a contributor and you don't have all the answers. So you've got to learn. Mike Smith, thanks so much for your time.